Okay, let me now say a few words about um, spatial data and um, the types of spatial data and how we will formally um, consider them in the analysis and, and what's required in practice to actually be able to do spatial analysis. We'll get to that in a few minutes. The major distinction that we'll make here and throughout the semester is between three types of things that happen in space and that we will record, observe as spatial data. One we refer to as events. Events are things that happen in a particular location. For example, the addresses of the people with cholera in the snow map or the addresses where the burglaries happened in the newspaper Google map. Those are locations of events. Now what does this mean? It means that you only observe those events that actually happened. For example, if some would-be burglar was looking at a car and figured out it had an alarm system that was too hard to crack and walked on, the burglary did not happen. We do not observe that. So for practical purposes, when we try to explain the patterning of, say, the burglaries, we're only dealing with part of the story. We're only dealing with those data points that actually happened. And that will affect what we can say and how much we can say in the analysis. The second type of data is continuous, is smooth. Everything is about smoothness. And, and this is, of course, uh, an artifact. It's a simplification of reality. But a lot of uh, models in environmental analysis, for example, make this assumption that there is a smooth process that happens in two or three dimensions and that generates, for example, a surface of air quality or a surface of temperature or rainfall. Uh, these are the classic examples. Now, how do we approach this? We, we're not in a position to measure temperature at every possible location. What we do is we have gauges at particular points. And then from that information, we construct a surface. A major uh, activity in this respect is what we will call spatial interpolation, which is coming up with data for locations where we don't observe the data. So if I have a temperature gauge at my house, but I don't have one here, I have to somehow come up with a temperature for this location. And I do that by taking the temperature at temperatures at the different sample points and construct a model for a surface from those sample points. And that, as some of you may know, is what we do in geostatistics. Then a third type of spatial observation is what we refer to as discrete spatial objects. And this is maybe a little abstract. The importance of it is, is that it's not continuous. For example, when you deal with counties, counties are not a continuous surface. Counties are individual entities. They're countable. You can have very many of them, but never a smooth, continuous surface. You can't fill in. You can't stick another county in between two counties. In other words, they exhaust the space. We'll get back to that in a few minutes. Whereas your sample points, they don't exhaust the space. I mean, I didn't have a gauge here, but what if I put one here? And then I can put another one in between my house and here, and so on. And fill up the space with more and more gauges, and eventually, but not practically, I will approximate the continuous surface by having an infinitely large number of observation points. That's very different from this one here. Here we have each observation point as a discrete object. And this type of analysis is called lattice data analysis. We'll get to it in a few minutes. It's really a misnomer, but it's a historical, um, there's a historical reason for it. But the example of this would be, say, you study county income. You're, you're looking at, say, whether there's convergence or divergence of the uh, income between counties in the U.S. You have a spatial pattern of counties with data associated with it. It's very different 
from say burglaries and the locations where they happened or from trying to model a smooth surface I've been giving you environmental examples but another example would be say a price surface if you're interested in real estate analysis and you observe house sales at particular points can you construct a surface of prices so that on any arbitrary point you can come up with a predicted house price that's another example what makes this spatial data special as we already know the where matters location is everything and with location being so important there are two things two concepts that come into play which don't really come into play in traditional statistical analysis one is the fact that the dependence correlation and we'll call this spatial autocorrelation later on is the rule now observing correlation is one thing explaining where it comes from is another and we have theoretical foundations like spatial interaction theory contagion externalities copycatting those are the conceptual the theoretical foundations the processes that give us the spatial autocorrelation it's important not to confuse the two we will be observing certain characteristics of the data like spatial autocorrelation but sometimes we will not be able to say what processes generated this particular outcome that requires additional information and this is referred to as an identification problem economists will be familiar with this term and that's a major problem in spatial analysis because as we'll see later we really don't have a lot of information even though we may have a very detailed map as it turns out that's only one data point point. and what can you do with one data point the other thing that's important in um, it's important in a lot of endeavors but in spatial analysis the scale of analysis matters a lot and we'll see some consequences of that in a few minutes of uh, how things can go wrong and how things can change 